Proverbs chapter 22, if you would please. Proverbs chapter 22. And uh, we've been dealing with the family. And uh, trust and pray that uh, uh, you have gotten something from it so far. And heard some good comments. And praise the Lord for that. Uh, it's just the Word of God that God speaks to us and what we're excited about. Uh, chapter 22 is the main verse that we're looking at. And if you can leave your hand there or put a marker there or something, go back to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. This was our memory work for the month of May. And uh, behold, I say how they reward us to come to cast us out of the possessions which thou hast given us to inherit. O our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us, neither know we what to do, but our eyes are on thee, upon thee. It is so important that when we understand that as an individual, as a Christian, as a family, that we are the minority and that there is a whole company of people against us. Uh, we've used a number of illustrations over recent days in the news media where that they're out to destroy the family. But thank God that He established the family. The first institution was the family. The second institution was the government. And the third institution was the local New Testament church. That's what God established. Those three things are the establishments of God. And uh, that's what we see that uh, the world is out to get. And so what we do when we go to raise our family, we look to God. Our eyes are upon thee. And uh, then it said that, that uh, Judah stood before the Lord uh, with their children, their wives, their little ones. We, well, we need to understand that we stand before God and that we've got to give an account. In Proverbs 22, verse 6, Train up a child, and the way it should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Our first message that we talked, we talked about children are being born with Adam's nature. Every one of us, we're born with an old sin nature. We do what we do because that is our nat nature. That's the natural thing for us to do. We're born sinners. We're born in rebellion. We're born to question. We're born with all of the different situations because of the sin of Adam. The next time we talked about the special tendencies that are towards evil that is because of our fathers, because of our father's fathers and our father's father's father. Uh, because we looked at the scripture where that the iniquities of the, of the fathers unto the children and children's children unto the third and fourth generation. We used the illustrations there. So we have that that we dealt with and understand. Then we talked about in our third message that children are fearfully and wonderfully made. That every child that is born in this world, God has special attention with each and every one of them. We talked about how that God was omnipresent. That means that He's everywhere. That He is all-powerful. And that He is all-knowing. From Psalms 139, we've talked about that. So if God's all-present, would He be in a mother's womb when that child is being developed? Amen. Amen. He is right there with every child in such. Then last week we preached on God's sovereignty in the birth and the life of a child. How that God is the one who is able to bring forth life and to give this great gift. And in His sovereignty we understand that. Now many times when we look at Proverbs chapter 22, we, we, we see that there is a misinterpretation of this scripture. Many people read it and they understand it this way. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. So a lot of people have the idea, the interpretation, well, if I'm going to train up my child in Sunday school, and I'm going to train up my child in church, and I'm going to train up my child with a, with a devotion time, uh, then when he is old, if he departs from it, he'll come back to it. And that's not what the Bible says that a lot of people have that interpretation. That they're going to train him up, and then when he goes his own way, if he decides to come back, that's the way that, that it's supposed to be and such. Uh, people get the idea that kids can go out here and sow their wild oats, and then they'll get right with God. Now, 
As a matter of fact, that has happened many times. Many times that has happened, but that's not the proper interpretation for this verse. But that happens, we praise God. I know a lot of folks, they go out and sow wild oats and then they pray for a crop failure. But crop failures doesn't come. When we sow our oats, wild oats, we will reap them and that will benefit and come into our family and even affect upon each and every one. So we're going to look at this morning an understanding of this. First of all, Heavenly Father, Lord, we do love You and we do thank You for Your love for us. We thank You for each and every one that is here. And we pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that You anoint me with Your power, with Your unction, with Your blessing. Give me the clarity of thought and mind. I pray that the Holy Spirit would work in all of our hearts, adults, teenagers, children. Lord, that we may grasp these truths in our hearts and cling to them to help us to be able to know You and to live for You better. Lord, if there's one or two or more here that doesn't know Christ as their Savior, it is our desire that they would trust Christ before it's eternally too late. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. And the people said, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. My pastor taught, told me a story of his pastor, and his pastor was named Art Wilson. And Art Wilson was an evangelist back in Kansas, back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And he would carry a big tent around and he would go and preach in a lot of places. He was in a Kansas county seat. That was the largest town in this particular county. And he was holding a revival, had the big tent up, and it wasn't very well attended. And so the newspaper guy came by and, and Brother Wilson thinking, you know, they're going to take an interview of me. And, and he, said, he said, well, I want to tell folks they need to be here on Saturday night because Saturday night we're going to auction off a baby. And the reporter looked at him and said, what? He says, we're going to auction off a baby on Saturday night. He said, I got a couple and they're going to auction off this baby. And so it came out in the newspaper. Well, the folks in the community, they said, well, he can't do that. And the social workers and folks said, you know, he can't auction off a baby. And they called the sheriff. And the sheriff went out to the big tent to see Brother Wilson. He said, he says, you can't auction. He said, well, come Saturday night and see and uh, Saturday night, boy, I want you to know the tent was packed, packed from, from cover to cover. All the people were up there all over the place to come and see him. And the sheriff and a couple of his deputies were right close by. And they told Brother Wilson, and said, you try to auction that baby up and we'll arrest you right in front of everybody. You cannot do that. And so right in front of everybody, when he got up, time for him to get up. He brought this couple out, and as they stepped out on the platform, he says, we're going to start. Remind me, and I'll tell you the rest of the story at the end of the message. Okay? Stay with me. Now, this verse, train up a child in the way he should go. We need to understand this. It simply means each child is an individual. Each child has a personality. Each child has been given gifts and talent. Each child has a particular bent that God wants him or her to go. It was interesting this week on the news. Did anybody see the lady with the four little girls? The identical twins or identical uh, quadruplet, whatever it is. Four, look, you saw that. Four little girls and they're all identical. And yet mom says, well, this one has this trait, this one has this trait, this one does this, this one's a daredevil, this one's a daddy's girl, and, and, that, and brought out how that they were identical twins, yet each one of them, because of the sovereignty of God and the purpose of God, they are unique individual in themselves. And so Proverbs is telling us to train up a child in the way he should go, in the bit, in the characteristic of his life. When he is old, when he talked about when he is old, he's talking about mature enough. When that child is mature enough to make the right kind of decisions. That's where you and I come in in raising children. We raise up children. We help them to come to the age where that they are going to have to make the right kind of decision. That's the training that's involved, is to help them to make the right decisions. I, you know, Grandpa got in trouble the other day. Uh, one of the grandkids was getting a, uh, getting a, uh, a Frosty or something at the end of his meal. 
And and uh, Dad sent him up there to get it, and, and and Grandpa got up there to help him. And, and Dad found out that 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 grandson is learning responsibility to get up there and go his own. I, I, I catch that. I'm a little slow, but I catch that. You know. But grandparents are like that. We we try to help our kids. Spoil our like grandkids. Grandkids is reward of not killing your own kids. And so. <laughs> Here, here we see that that with that you help them, you train them, you work with them so they're mature enough to know how to make the right decision. Uh, train up a child in the ways you go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. Will not depart. In other words, that which he had been taught, that which he had been trained, that which he had been discipled in is going to be part of the characteristic of his life. And that's why you have to understand and know your child as to what the direction in which they are going, which God has for them. If your child is going to be a doctor and, and, and you try to give him a baseball glove or a football or a hockey stick, and say, man, I want you in the sport, but he won't, and, and he is interested in things, you would be better off directing to be a doctor. If the child wants to be a musician or child wants to be this, that, and that, whatever it is, you find out the direction in which your child is going and you train and work with them to help them to go in that direction. Now, turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 20. If you would please, Deuteronomy chapter 20. And we'll pick up in verse number 1. When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies and see if horses and chariots and a people more than thou be not afraid of them for the Lord thy God is with thee which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt and it shall be when the uh, come nigh unto battle that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people and they shall say unto them hear O Israel ye approach this day unto, uh, unto battle against your enemies let not your hearts faint fear not do not tremble neither or neither be terrified because of them for the Lord for the Lord your God is go uh, with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you now here in the military of Israel is talking about here and the priest is assuring them that as they go out to fight the battles that as a military in Israel that they are going to go and be involved in this, not to be afraid that God is with them. Now, what they're giving them here also is some privileges, rights, and responsibility of a military soldier. We see that in verse number 5, if you would please. And the officer uh, shall speak unto the people, saying, What man is there that hath built a new house, and hath not dedicated it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man dedicate it. Now, I want you to notice that little word, dedicate. Now, what he is saying here is that if a man has built a house and he has not yet had a chance to dedicate it, then he goes to battle, he gets killed, then somebody else is going to have to come and dedicate it. Somebody else is going to have to do that. Remember the story of excuses? There's other illustrations here of a soldier being dismissed. They said, I've taken a wife, therefore I cannot come, you know, and, and, and you get seven years off for taking a wife and that. These are some of the privileges that are here. But I want you to look with me at that little word dedicate. The word dedicate is a Hebrew word, kodnak, uh, kodnak. And that's the same word if you look in Proverbs chapter 22 for the word train. The word train and the word dedicate comes from the same Hebrew word and it, and it simply means uh, to dedicate, it means to vow, it means to promise, it means to make a commitment. And so what God is saying here is that a man is to train his household, is to dedicate his house, is to spend time with his house, his new house, his new household. And that gives you a responsibility, men, to understand you have to spend time with your family. You have to spend time with your wife. You have to spend time with your children. You have to spend time, you have to dedicate yourself to that. You have to purposely be involved with that. Now, the question many times comes that can a person dedicate another person to God. We can dedicate pianos. 
and say, we want to dedicate this for the Lord's service and use it to playing godly music and honoring God. When God gives us our building, we'll dedicate our building. We'll have a service and say, this is what God has done to God be the glory. We dedicate that for His purpose and for His glory. But can a person dedicate another? Can an individual with an individual will dedicate another individual with another individual will? Well, there are those who say, no, that can't be done. But let's look what the Bible says. Amen? Look what the Bible has to say. Proverbs chapter number uh, 31, if you would please. Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31. And verse number 1. The words of King Linmel prophecy that his mother taught him. Now notice what his mother taught. She said, What my son, the son of my womb, the son of my vows, give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. Now she goes on and she gives him some instructions. She gives him some kinah, some training. And we look here and we see in the text that we have that word son of my womb and the son of my vows. That word vow comes from the same Hebrew words which means to dedicate. To means to dedicate. So here we see that this king's mother, when he was even in his her womb, even when she made a vow that I am going to dedicate this child within my womb, I am going to dedicate him. And then she sets out in Kanaka to be able to train that child, to be able to work with that child, that even from the time that before he was born throughout his life, she gave him instructions on how to be raised, how to be dedicated to God. Now, sometimes people talk, well, you're talking about child dedication. Does that mean that if I dedicate my child to God, that God's going to call them to be a missionary? Or if I dedicate my child to God, that my child's going to be a, a preacher or a preacher's wife. If I dedicate my child to God, does that mean that? It doesn't mean that at all. Matter of fact, there are too many mama called and daddy sent preachers that are out there. They need to be called of God to do that. But a dedicating a child to the Lord is as simply meaning, as simply as uh, 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 this child, which God gave to me, I'm just going to give him back to God. This child, which God gave to me, I'm going to give him back to God. Remember the King Lenino's wife, a mother, son of my vow, that's dedication. That is to be set apart for a set aside for a special purpose, to declare an intention. And she had a special purpose for her son. She had an intention for her son. And when we come to say God gives us our children, that we want to give them back to Him, we want to set them aside for a special purpose. We want to say, Lord, here's my child. I want to dedicate that child to You. I want You to take my child and use him as You would for Your honor and for Your glory. In the Christian life, things are not... Now listen. In a Christian life, things are not sacred and secular, holy and worldly, hallowed and fleshly. The word for a Christian, everything that you and I have as believers is sacred with God. It is holy with God. It is hallowed with God. Every aspect of our Christian life as a believer in our relationship with God, it is not to be worldly, it's not to be fleshly, it's not to be secular at all. Now, we live in a worldly world. We live in a secular world. We live in a world with all of this around about us. And that's where the Bible says, Come out from amongst them and be a separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean. That's where we grow in our Christian walk and in our Christian life. And as we grow inside, closer to God, outside we let our light shine. Inside, we grow closer to God. Outside, we let our light shine. Now, I, I, I'm not, uh, I don't know if you're a big football fan or not, but uh, you might not know this, but the Philadelphia Eagles won the Super Bowl 
this last uh, January, February, whenever they had the Super Bowl. Big deal. The unique thing about the Philadelphia Eagles is over half the team is born again, outstanding believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. They make no bones about it. They're coach. They're men. They have had other men get saved and they baptize them. They have had other men come to know Christ as their Savior. They are very, very, very outspoken. They should not have won the Super Bowl, but they, the whole team, says to God be the glory that they were able to win the Super Bowl. Now, I don't know whether you're going to mix things like that, but this is one thing I do know. These men have a relationship with God that they don't care who's out there. They're going to let people know that they're a Christian. And it all started with a, with a black football player by the name of Reggie White. Reggie White was a bat, black Baptist preacher, and he didn't care who knew about it. And he was a football player. And because of his outstanding testimony, uh, before the news media and the newspaper and Sports Illustrated and everything, other Christian athletes started standing up. It, they give credit to that, but I say, you know what? You talk to them individually, you find they give credit to God. Because the more that you know God in your heart, and the closer that you get to God in your heart, the more you're going to let Him out. The more that you're going to let people know you're not ashamed of Him, and He's not ashamed of you. And matter of fact, He said, if we don't stand and give a testimony for men, how are we going to be able to stand before God? It is so important that we understand this. Now, the whole life of a Christian is to be spiritually connected to God. Lord, I declare my intent. I want you to direct my life as a Christian. Every mom, every dad, that ought to be your prayer. This is my intention. I want you, God, to lead and direct in my life. I want you to have control of my life. And it's saying when we train, when we make a vow, when we dedicate our child, we come, Lord, I declare my intention. I want you to direct the life of my child. And you know what? When you say that, when you dedicate your life to God, and you dedicate the life of your child to God, things begin to happen. God is going to be moving on your behalf and on that child's behalf. We can understand this. Let me have you go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. When we dedicate our family, husband and wife, when we dedicate our family, husband, wife, and children, we begin to see God do something for us that He will not do for others. God's not a respecter of person. But there is an area of relationship that we have with God. I want you to notice in chapter 7, 1 Corinthians, New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And uh, we're going to begin in verse number 12. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother that hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not excuse, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. Now I, I want to, to make this clear at the very beginning. In verse number 12, Paul says, But the rest speak I and not the Lord. Now, Paul is saying here, I want you to understand, our Lord Jesus Christ gave commandments and teachings concerning the family. And He did. He says, Now I am speaking, and I am speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. This is still inspired Scripture. There are some people that look at that and they say, well, this isn't the Word of God because Paul is speaking. Paul is speaking here because this right here was not an issue when Jesus was teaching on the family. Now, what is the issue? Paul had gone to Corinth. And believer, the people became believers. And here's a husband that became a believer and his wife an unbeliever. Here's a wife that became a believer and her husband's the unbeliever. And so, what's going to happen on this? 
And so Paul is teaching them that as a believing husband, if it does well for him to stay with his wife, if she's not going to leave him, that to continue dwelling with them. Dwell with that wife, though she be unsaved. And for their wife, even though her husband might be unsaved, it is better to dwell with the unsaved husband. That, that's the purpose of it. And that's what happens. And notice what it says. He says in verse number 14, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband, else your children unclean. Now what does that mean? Does that mean the husband is saved because the wife is saved? No. Does that mean that the wife is saved because the husband? No. It means the word that it deals with, we see it twice, the word sanctified, and it, uh, in verse number uh, uh, 14, it deals with uh, uh, being sanctified, it uses it twice, and then it uses the word holy, talking about the children, one time. These are all the same Greek word, uh, helios, and it means to be set apart. And so what Paul is saying to the believing husband, though your wife is an unbeliever, because of you, your testimony, your influence, she is set apart. She's set apart. That God's going to be working on her and dealing with her. The husband is set apart because of a believing wife. That's what the word sanctified. It means set apart. It doesn't mean that they're a believer now. It means that they have the opportunity and the influence of the believer to come to know Christ as their Savior. Same thing with the children. There is a special relationship because of the believers, because of you as a believer with Jesus Christ, there is a special relationship that your child has with God. And though they might not be saved at this time, and so whether that, that's what Paul is dealing with here. As a believer, God has an interest in your children. As a believer, God has, you have a spiritual influence upon your children. Now, there's a fellow got on a bus. And as he was walking through the bus, he said, do you have grandkids? Yeah. you have grandkids? Yeah. you have grandkids? No. He said, good, let me sit down and show you pictures of my grandkids. <laughs> Now, we're, I, I, I guarantee you, I'm more interested in my children than you are, my children. Uh, you're interested in your children more than I'm interested in your children. As a pastor, I'm interested. But I'm not near as interested in your children. You are more interested in your grandchildren than you are my grandchildren. Why is that? Because of relationship. I want us to realize that as a believer, your child is in a special standing before God. Even though they might not be saved yet. You as a believer, you are putting your child in a special relationship. Now, please don't understand. I'm not talking about household salvation because mom and dad saved, everybody else is going to get saved. God has no grandchildren. Did you get that? God has no grandchildren. Everyone is a child of God. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ and ask for forgiveness of sin, as you repent of your sin and put your faith and trust in God, you are a child of God. God has no grandchildren. But there is that special relationship. Children of believing parents are set apart and a special standing with God. 1 Samuel chapter 1, if you would please. 1 Samuel chapter 1. Beginning in verse number 9, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 9. And Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest set a, a, set a, a seat by the post of the temple, and uh, Hannah was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept. And she bowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thy handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thy handmaid, and give me a thy handmaid a man-child, that I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. So Hannah was praying, and she said, Lord, if you give me a man-child, I will give that man-child back to you. And we see that the man-child down in verse number 20, and says, Wherefore it came, uh, time was come, about Hannah had conceived, uh, that she bare a son, and called his name Samuel, saying, because I ask him of the Lord. Now Samuel is a Hebrew word, uh, Shemuel, and it means ask of the Lord. 
The word ask is a word that deals with uh, a shaw. It means to, to, uh, uh, to receive from, to ask of, uh, uh, and to give of. Uh, and so she said that God, if the, I'm asking you that you would give me a man child. God gave her a man child. She named him after asking of the Lord. And Hannah dedicated Samuel to the Lord. And as we see here, that, that she comes down in verse number 24. And when she had weaned Samuel, she took him up with her with three bullocks and one heap for a flower and a bottle of wine, brought him unto the high, uh, house of the Lord in Shiloh, and the child was young. And they slew the bullock and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O oh, my Lord, as thou liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition that I ask of him. Therefore, as I have lent him to the Lord, as long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord, and he worship the Lord there. Now, here we see that Hannah, she said, God, if you give me a man child, I'll give him back to you. And when he was weaned, and, and when he was grown up and was of age, she brought him to the house of the Lord, and she gave him unto the Lord right there. Now, I want us to look very simply at the responsibility. It was a continual responsibility. From the time that he was born and received into this world, she began to work with him. She had a responsibility. Matter of fact, Elkanah went up to Jerusalem to the worship, and she said, you know what, we're going to stay home. Me and Samuel are going to stay home. And she stayed home until he was weaned. Now, there are two school of thoughts. Some people believe that he was three years old to be weaned. Now, I would hate to be the priest that would have a three-year-old come. Others believe, and rabbinical scholars believe, that he was about ten years of age when he came. And so, Hannah had him until he was about ten years of age. And that's more likely because, you see, every year after, she would come and see him at the temple, and she would bring a new coat for him. Why? Because he was outgrowing that new coat. And those years of 10 to 14, 15 and up, you kind of, they, they get that growth spurt. So you see that he was about 10 years of age uh, when he was there. But it took time and connection for Hannah. She did not go on trips with her husband. She stayed there and spent time with her child. It is important that we understand it takes time and connection to train up a child. To dedicate a child is saying, you know what, I'm going to put that child in a place where they will truly be there and in investing time and effort. I know it's convenient to stick them in front of the TV set while you've got other things to do. But the truth of the matter is, you have to have some time and effort with your children. You say, how can you do it? I don't know, ask uh, Susanna Wesley. She only had 21 kids. You know, she spent time with many of them. All of them. You see, it, it, it is a time of, res of, of understanding, of responsibility, of continuing on. Now look with me at 1 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles chapter number 4. 1 Chronicles chapter 4. The, story of the, the prayer of Jabez. is right here. 1 Chronicles chapter 4. It's the prayer of Jabez. In verse 10, the Bible says, Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Bold wilt thou and bless me indeed, and enlarge my coast, and that thy hand might be with me, that thou wouldst keep me from evil, and that it may be uh, that may not grieve me. And the Lord granted that which he requested. Now I want you to notice that God granted that which he requested. The word requested is the same Hebrew word, Sheol, that we talked about up there that, that was being asked of the Lord. And here's that, 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 that Jabez is saying, I am making a request of you. And you know what? You have to not only spend time and connect with your child, you have to pray for your child. You have to pray for your child. Prayer is where that it's going to make a difference in children, in grandchildren. It takes a lot of what we call neology. Neology is when we're on our knees praying for our children. And it takes a lot of work and a lot of effort. Not only that, look with me in 1 Samuel. Back to 1 Samuel uh, chapter 22. 
1 Samuel chapter 22. Uh, there was a couple of, there was these people traveling, and uh, there wasn't a lot of priests, a lot of people in the world or in the area at that time. And so there was a family that had their own priest. They had their private chaplain. And so these guys were traveling in uh, 1 Samuel 22. And, uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. This is the story of, of where that uh, David, uh, David, uh, I got ahead of myself. I'll come back to that in just a second. Uh, we saw that there was request, a privilege to request for your children. Secondly, to ask others to pray for you. Notice what it says in verse 9. 2 Samuel 22, 1 Samuel 22, verse 9. 1 Samuel 22, 9. Then answered Yah the Edomite, which was set over the servants of Saul, and said, I saw the son of Jesse, that would have been David, coming to Nob of Ahimelech, and he, the son of Jesse, uh, or, or rather Ahimelech, acquired of the Lord for David. He, Ahimelech, the, the, the priest, inquired of the Lord for David and gave him victuals and gave David the sword of Goliath. And so here that we see the word inquire, it deals with the same word as request. It deals with the same word as an ask. And so here, David is asking someone else to inquire of someone else to ask of God. You need to ask other people to help you raise your kids. You need to ask other people to pray for you. You know what happens a lot of times with family? We're a little bit embarrassed because of what our sons or our daughters have done and we won't ask other people to pray for them. And we take it all on ourselves. As brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to pray one for another. And David had gone to the priest of Himelech so that he would inquire to God, that he, the priest, would pray to God for dead for David and to help him out in this matter. And we, we understand this very simply. Go with me to Judges chapter 18. Judges chapter 18. And verse number 5. Now here was these men traveling. And, and there was a, 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 a household that had their own priest. Verse number 4. And uh, Judges chapter 18 verse 4. And he said unto him, Thus and thus dealeth Micah with me, and he hath hired me, and I am his priest. And they, these people that were traveling, they said unto him, Ask counsel, we pray thee, of God, that we may know whether uh, our, our way which we go shall be prosperous. So they come to this priest, they come to this private chaplain, and they said, Would you pray to God? Would you ask counsel of God, uh, of God, as to whether we're going in the right direction? Whether the way we're going is going to be prosperous. You know, it's important to pray, have others pray for the direction of your children. And have other people pray for the direction even of your life. There's nothing wrong with this, folks. You need to make a big decision. Ask somebody to pray with you. You say, well, I don't know who I can ask. Have a confidant. Have somebody, a brother or sister in Christ, another family, somebody that you know, you've got to make a big decision. Ask them, if you're going, in, would you pray and ask God that I'm going in the right direction, that I'm doing the right thing in raising my children. These are all understandable and important. We see the illustration with this back in Judges chapter 13. Judges 13. Here we see Manoah. Manoah. In Judges 13, verse, verse number 3, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman, and said unto her, Behold now, thou art barren, and bearest not. But thou shalt conceive, and bear a son. Now, this is going to be the mother of Samson. And the Lord comes to her and says, You know what? You're going to have a child. And so we go over to verse 8. Then Manoah entreated the Lord, and the word entreated is that word that means to ask, it means to request, it means to take counsel. And Manoah entreated the Lord and said, O oh Lord, O oh my Lord, let the man of God which thou didst send come again unto us and teach us that we should do unto the child that shall be born. Look down in verse number 12. And Manoah said, Now let thy words come to pass, how we should order the child, and 
And how shall we do unto him? And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Of all that thou said unto the woman, let her beware. She shall she may not eat anything that cometh from the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink, nor eat unclean things. All that I command her, let her observe. Let her be aware. Let her observe. First of all, I want us to know that Manoah, he went to the God and says, okay, how are we going to order this child? Train up a child in the way he should go. He is saying, how are we going to know the bent or the direction in which this child is going? How are you going to know it unless you pray and ask God for it? Pray and ask God to help you to know how to direct your child. And then we see the responsibility. He says, let the woman beware. Let her beware. And then he said, all that I command thee, let her observe what she said. Listen, the care of a mother is so important in raising and dedicating children or a child unto the Lord. Now, is dedication a service where that we have a public service and invite people who are going to dedicate babies and stuff? I've been there, and that's what we did with our children. And, and, and I'm all for it. Somebody want to dedicate their children, we'll have a Sunday and we'll dedicate children, your family to the Lord. I've done it. I, 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 I don't go around publicizing it. It's kind of like anointing with oil. The Bible says, let those that are sick call for the pastor and the elders to come and anoint them with oil. I just don't go around throwing oil everywhere. But when I'm called, I go. You say, do you anoint people with oil? Yes, I have. But the truth of the matter is, we have to say more than just a dedicated public service. It is a dedication of the life of the parents to be involved with their child, to help them to go in the right direction which God has called them. One last verse. Psalms 27. Psalms 27. And verse number 4. One thing I have desired of the Lord. One thing I have desired of the Lord. That I will seek after. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord. And to inquire his temple to have a desire you have a deep desire you have a longing in your heart you have an accomplishment in your part of saying dear God I want to dedicate my child my children to you I want to train them up I want to help them to go in the right direction. It is a desire within your heart. Again, it is W-O-R-K. It is time. It is connection. That's what it takes. I have yet to meet a man who spent all of his time at work and he dies and on his deathbed he says, I wish I'd given more hours at work. Usually I wish I'd spent more time with my family I wish I'd spent more time with my kids. I wish I'd spent more time with my grandkids. Nobody dies from this world and said, I wish I'd give more to the company. Right now is the time that you can invest in your family. You can invest in your family. You cannot auction off that baby. But yet Art Wilson stood, the tent packed wall to wall, cover to cover, and he says, right now, we're going to start the auction right now. And the mom and dad, they stand up. And he said, now, as we start this out, who give me the first bid? And as the sheriff was coming up, a man with a baseball uniform, a ball, and a bat, and a glove, stepped forward, and he said, sir, the sports world makes a bid for that child. The sports world would like to have that child in sports. We'd love for him to play baseball. We'd love for him to play football. We'd love for him to play hockey. And he stood there and for about three minutes, the sports world is putting a bid in for your child. And about that time, there was a couple over here and they stood up. She wore all this glorious, glorious uh, outfit and he was dressed to the hilt and he said, Hollywood. Hollywood is putting a bid for your child. Hollywood wants your child. Hollywood wants your child to come and enjoy the lifestyle that only Hollywood can give. 
And a businessman stood up and said, the business world wants your child. The business world wants your child to be involved with business, to make lots of money. Lots and lots and lots of money. The musician stood and said, oh, the music world would like to have you to play in the great symphony, the great hall. They, all of these are putting in a bid for your children. And I'm not saying all these things are wrong. I'm just saying as a Christian, and Art Wilson was saying as a Christian, dedicate your child to God. And if you dedicate your child to God, and God calls them to be a football player or a hockey player, or God calls them to be a, 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 a fireman, or God calls them to be an astronaut, a scientist, a lawyer. Oh, I don't know about lawyers. If God calls them to... Yeah, we need lawyers. <laughs> Whatever God called them, they can go into that. But you dedicate them to God. And you can't dedicate anybody to God. You can't dedicate yourself to God unless you first know Him. You have to first have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You have to know that you were born in this world as a sinner. And as a sinner, you had a debt to pay. That debt was separated from God in a place called hell. And you could not pay the debt, but Jesus Christ paid that debt for you. And if you would ask Christ to forgive you of your sins, come into your heart, and to be your personal Savior, you can experience what is called the new birth. I cannot do it for you. This church cannot do it for you. It takes the work of the Holy Spirit in your heart. If you know in your heart that when you die, you're not going to heaven, you know in your heart you're not in a right relationship with God, you don't even know God, then today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to put your faith and trust in Him. For He and He alone gives you everlasting life. Heavenly Father, we love You and we thank You for Your love for us. We ask, O oh Father, that in this moment of invitation, Lord, that if there are those who...